closer and get closer and closer to God each and every day. Then I remember here comes Daniel, bam, <coughs> walking right to God, the steadfast, on fire, sold out for Jesus, doing the right thing, bringing the gospel, living it, feeling it, loving it, singing it, preaching it. Somebody say amen. 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 That's why we here. That's why we here. We're in awesome army. Ain't nobody take that from you. Nobody steal your joy. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We're going to have it all together again. But we're going somewhere. Good. We're moving forward. Good. Good. Not backwards, not to the left or to the right. We're moving forward. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Said that, we're going to sing, we're going to worship, we're going to give God the glory. I want to hear y'all sing it tonight. Okay? Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, praise God. You know that? Amen. Amen.
shepherds all about that win.
so many here, Lord, that are in pain and hurting tonight, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you would go to the bodies tonight, Lord, and touch them with you, Lord God. Glorify yourself tonight, Lord God, and relieve people here of pain tonight, Lord God. Stop the sickness that continues to drive it out here tonight, Lord God. Let your anointing be upon Brother Wolf tonight, Lord God, and preach the message to Lord Father. And be with the lessons, Lord God, as they represent the mission tonight and explain about the mission and what it is all about, Lord God. We ask that your anointing be here with them, Lord God. Lord, be with Jerome on his trip, Father, and help him, Lord God, protect him from the evil that's out there, Lord God, and help him physically and spiritually, Lord God, emotionally. Just give him a blessed time to come back to friends and ready to get back to doing what he does so well. For those here that had a request but weren't able to vocalize it, Lord God, Lord, we just lift up each person here to you, and we ask it in your precious name, Lord. Amen. 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 Well, don't forget, those of you that are in the Christmas program, we have practice Saturday night at 7.30, and uh, please uh, bring your costume or wear it, whichever, so that you'll be able to uh, go through our program and see what needs to be said. Is this thing on? Now it is. Now. Okay. Pro program practice again, just in case. I know sometimes I talk kind of soft, I think. That's because I talk soft to carry a big stick. And uh, so I just uh, appreciate the Lord helping us, though, at times. And if I get too low where you can't hear me, just raise your hand, because I know none of you ever do when you're blessed. So just raise your hand that way. I'll know to speak a little louder for you, okay? Um, it's very important as we as Christians to be able to have help. Um, and I'm not talking about physical help. I'm talking about spiritual help. 
We come to a time in our Christian experience where when we walk with the Lord, we recognize I need something greater to help me. And we find here in this passage of scripture that I'm going to give to us tonight, where Jesus is in the Last Supper dis discussing some things that are going to transpire um, once Calvary has been accomplished and what they need to kind of look for uh, as far as him leaving them. You know, here they are. I, I never will forget when um, we had our uh, conference president and he'd been the president for several years ever since I had been a part of the conference. And then uh, all of a sudden he resigned and went out west and took a church. And I remember how I felt just devastated. I thought to myself as a young Christian, what are we going to do without him as our leader? He's led us this far. He's taken, taken us to this place as far as the conference is concerned. And we grew and we were able to see lots of things. And I thought, who in the world is going to take his place? You know, and when we finally did vote and the man was voted in uh, that took his place, I still thought, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? And I think in my own heart, this is probably what was taking place in the disciples' lives when they were uh, at the table and he began to talk about, uh, don't let your heart be troubled because I'm going to leave you. But I won't leave you alone. I'll always be there. But I want to give you something else that's going to help strengthen you to be able to walk with me. And so if you look with me tonight in St. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 16. St. John 14, beginning with verse 15. St. John chapter 14. You, you've been able to find it, Kovac? Ivan 14, got it? Okay, all right. Let's look at verse 15 here. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I find a lot of people today professing to love Jesus Christ and not following him very closely. They're kind of like some of the disciples you read about in the Gospels. They were following him, but they followed him afar off. They really weren't interested in knowing and being a part of his group, except just to maybe hear a little bit of tidbit over there. But he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you tomorrow. Next week? A couple days. Forever, right, forever. Let's say that word together, forever. forever. Good for you. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, with you, and shall be in you, in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Father, we pray again tonight for your help. That's all we can depend upon. We're not anything, dear Lord, without you. And Lord, we realize tonight the blessed Holy Ghost has to come in power and move upon our lives and our hearts, not just being something that we just think is a mystical something out there, but oh, that he might be with us and that he might live within us. Praise God forever. We pray tonight, help us to get across the thoughts we want our men to learn, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe the uh, discourse of the Last Supper talk, um, I believe that it's a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture. If you read it all at one reading, rather than chopping it up and reading a chapter today and one tomorrow and one the next day, I think if you just sit down and read it, take about 25 minutes maybe if you're a slow reader, but to read the whole chapters there that, that concern what Jesus was talking to his disciples about. He knew they were concerned. He knew that they were up in arms, so to speak, as to what's going to happen to us. Now, we've left all. I can hear some of them say, we've left all in order to follow you. They had already said some of that. 
And here they were. Now he's going to leave them. And what's going to happen to us? And so he gives them this beautiful passage of Scripture. We have some knowledge of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Not as much as we do from the New Testament, because that's when he was given at the birth of the church. But we see here that in the Old Testament, there was many, many workings that was attributed to him. But now we're going to see him become more prominent because Jesus is going to go up and the Holy Spirit is going to come down. And so we see this evening that the Holy Spirit is involved in our world. He's involved in you. He's involved in people that profess to be a believer. He professed those that profess to be a believer. Well, first off, I believe looking at the office of the Holy Spirit tonight. First thing, I think the office of the Holy Spirit is to awaken, arrest the attention, excite the feelings, and produce conviction for sin. All of those things. He works on our hearts in order to be able to help us to see just how sinful we really are. We really don't know, do we? how sinful we really are until we come and stand before him and recognize. I, I have thought about all the individuals in the scriptures that have basically come face to face with God. And when they did, they recognized what they had and what they lacked and where they were and how minute they were in his presence. And of course, Isaiah is the one that comes most of the to the most of the mind prominently is because of the simple fact when he saw God there in the temple, high and lifted up, and the song being sung, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, back and forth. I believe that when he heard those things, that he recognized, what am I? What am I? I'm not anything compared to what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing. And he says, please, I am a man of unclean lips. He recognized where he stood before God. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to awaken us, friends. We're asleep in sin. Sin has rocked us to sleep in our cradle of uh, awful sin. And we've just gone on and on and on and wondered, well, what in the world do I need to do? You don't need to do anything. The Holy Ghost is going to talk to you. And he's going to awaken your heart. He's going to arrest your attention somehow, some way. And I've often wondered if he hasn't done what he's done to each of us here tonight in order to stop us in our tracks, in order for us to see the purpose God has for your life by coming to the mission. Amen. God, in his infinite mercy, stopped you. He arrested your attention. Got your attention, took everything away from you, took your job, took your family, took your livelihood, took everything. And here you are at the Fort Myers Rescue Mission. And what are we doing? We're trying our best to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. We're trying our best through the power of the Holy Ghost to help you to see what God's word intends for us as Christians and as believers. He's trying to awaken us arrest our attention, excite the feelings. I think when we become Christians, we don't have mule-faced religion. I believe that God gives us something way down on the inside where the, the heart just rings like a bell and the joy is just exuberant. It's unspeakable and it's full of glory. Amen. That's what God wants to do. He wants to excite our feelings. Let us sense Him and then produce conviction for sin. Over in chapter 16, here we have the same discourse. Jesus is still talking. In verse 7 and 8, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come... He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Amen. Praise God forever. Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to save us. And he sent the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit might empower us. 
that he might be able to awaken us out of our sinful condition and help us just exactly where we are. How many of you have ever seen an old skillet where maybe somebody cooked some gravy in it and let it sit for a little while? And then you tried to wash it out. It wasn't easy, was it? You had to scrub it in order to get all that flour, that dried, icky stuff out of that skillet. And then once you washed it, you dried it. But there was still something down on the inside of that old iron skillet. And you could set that thing on a hot fire, turn it upside down and let the heat begin to work it. And it begins to open up those iron pores and begins to shoot out the the evil that's inside there that you don't see just by using soap and water. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do to us. He wants to put our feet and our hearts and our minds to the fire so that we can be able to understand how he can help us to walk a way that's pleasing unto God. The Holy Spirit does it. You don't do it yourself. You can't do it. Oh, it would be wonderful if we could sit down and decide for ourselves, I'm going to be good. Does it work? (laughs) No, I'm afraid it doesn't. The second thing the Holy Spirit does, the province of the Spirit is to renew the mind. The mind is an awful thing, isn't it? And yet it's a wonderful thing. It's the greatest computer that was ever invented. And God put it all together and pieced it all together so that all the little channels could run where they need to be and have the little file cabinets in there so they'd be able to put the things just in the right place and give you the ability to be able to go back and find it in that little file cabinet, pull it out, look at it, and see it and remember it. God did some wonderful things with our mind. We see in Romans chapter 1, 12 and verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And, he didn't leave us there, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The renewing of the mind. Let me tell you something, friends. Some of us bring some baggage with us out of sin, don't we? Doesn't the devil drag up things that you did in your past? Doesn't the devil go in your fishing hole out there and pull up those things and dangle them in front of you and show you just exactly what you were and what you did back there and then tell you you don't have anything because you did those things? How many of you he doesn't do that to, huh? Every one of us, am I right? He pulls up things and sticks them in my face and I have to plead the blood over some of them. I have to ask God to help me. Give me victory over them. Why? Because my mind remembers those things. I remember them. The devil remembers them. And they co- coexist and bring them up together so that we will then think about those things. And some of the things we think about back there, we turn and go back to like a dog to its vomit. Hmm? I didn't hear very many amens on that. That's okay, you don't have to say it now. You don't have to say it now. You're too late. The province of spirit is to take the mind and renew it. It has to be made over again. It has to be changed. It has to be reworked. It has to be rewired, so to speak, if I could do it that way. But friends, I don't know what God does in order to renew my mind. I don't know what He does to help my channels not to go back there where they used to go, but now to go somewhere else that's more pleasing and more pleasant to Almighty God. That's what God wants to do with your mind. The Bible talks about heart. We need a heart change, friends. We need an old-fashioned heart change, a transformation in our hearts. Yes, we do. And say, friends, if you haven't had that transformation, you are not saved tonight. I'm telling you that much. But not only that, we have to have a transformation of our mind. It has to be renewed. Why? So we don't go back to the old channels. 
so we don't go back to the old ways, so the devil doesn't hound us with those things that we used to do, we used to say, we used to go, we used to act, we used to feel, all of those things in our mind, friends. And if your mind is not renewed, there's something wrong with your salvation tonight. Huh? That doesn't mean you don't have struggles with temptation, as I said this morning in devotions. It doesn't mean you don't have struggles with temptation, for surely you do. But I can tell you one thing. If you know where you are in the Lord tonight, then you can be able to stay victorious. And if you can be victorious this minute, you can be victorious in the next minute, and the next five minutes, and the next hour, and the next day, and the next week, and the next month, and the next year. Hallelujah forever. Why? Because our minds need to be renewed. Get out of the gutter. Clean it out, Lord. Change it. Make it new. Let it think on things that are positive. Think on things that are lovely. Think on things that are holy. This is the one that gets a lot of people. They forget to think on the things that are holy. It seems to me Paul was intending for us to, uh, to, to think on these things, to make ourselves sometimes think on these things. That's where God wants us, friends. And so we see that the, that the province of the Spirit is to renew the mind. It would be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think the third thing to, that about the Spirit is the function of the Holy Spirit is to enlighten and restore spiritual perception and help our spiritual sensibilities. In verse 17 of this chapter here, you see where he says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He'll give you spiritual perception. We can have that bell on the inside, as I've often stated. We have that thing that's there. And sometimes it doesn't ring true when something comes across that's false or has just a tense of falsity to it. Sometimes we feel like there's something wrong and we may not be able to explain why. There have been many times that something has come up that's not just been right with me. It just didn't sound right. It just didn't seem right. And it didn't seem like it should be according to God's will. And maybe I didn't have an answer for it. Maybe I couldn't tell why I felt like that. I just knew the bell didn't ring true. But he wants me and you to understand the spiritual sensibilities. God wants us to be spiritually sensible. We need to be able to look at things and know what they are. And you can't tell me that some of you haven't looked at some things and you could tell me very easily what they are, right? And then there's some things that you have looked at and you've told me, I have no idea what it is. I don't have a clue. But you see, God, the Holy Ghost, wants to come in and he wants to enlighten us. He wants us to be able, and how does he do that? He comes and lives with us and lives in us. It's kind of like being married in a sense. You pretty soon after a long life together, you begin to think alike. You begin to look alike. You begin to act alike. You begin to talk alike. Why? Because you've been together so long. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to be with you. But He doesn't want to be just with you. He wants to be in you. And when He's in you, then He can be able to enlighten you about some things that may be questionable. There are some things that are black and white. We know this is wrong. We know this is right. Praise God forever. And then there are some questionable things. Well, I'm not sure. It could be either or. There could be a gray area there. But you see, the blessed Holy Ghost will enlighten you and show you what is right about it and show you what might be wrong about it. And that's what we want. 
We want these sensibilities heightened by the Holy Spirit. That way, when the people come around and try to push false doctrine on you, you have a sensibility about you that's not right. There's something wrong with it. I may not be able to tell you what I think's wrong with it, but there's something wrong about it. You see what I mean? The spiritual sensibility. How sensitive are you? How sensitive are you about the things that are spiritual? God wants me and you to come to the place where we're enlightened. Where when we see it's something that's being enlightened, that means the light's been turned on. Just click. Real easy. But it's when you turn the light out and you begin to walk in darkness. The Bible says how great is that darkness. But you see, he's talking about here that the Spirit wants to enlighten us. He wants to restore our spiritual perception and help our spiritual sensibilities. I want to know when the Holy Spirit says to turn right, to turn right. I want to know when the Holy Ghost says to back up. I want to be able to back it up. I want to know the sensibilities of what God's Spirit can do for me in order to be able to help me to understand His function in my life. What He's doing. Show me, Lord. Help me to know. Guide me. Guide me into all truth. Help me to understand now, I may not be the smartest pencil in the box. I may not be the smartest pencil in the box. A lot of you out here may be smarter pencils than I am. But let me tell you something. I'm still a pencil. I'm still a pencil. And with the help of the Lord, He can help me to be sharp in Him and help me with the spiritual enlightenment, what I need to see, how I need to see, where I need to go, and where I need to stay away from. Fourth, it's the office of the Holy Spirit to implant and nourishes the grace, the graces of Christian character. Christian character. That's something we see lacking today in, in professed Christians. Huh? Christian graces. When you go to the store, hear me. When you go to the store, do you get mad? Somebody took my parking space sister. Somebody got in front of me at the counter. She charged me too much, and I'm going to let her have it, too. There it is. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm talking about? Amen. Amen. Huh? Christian graces yeah. means that we're a saved and sanctified individual under duress and under pressure, and when even we're done wrongly, we're still a Christian. We're still filled with the Spirit. Why? Because He's with us and in us. Amen. That's why. Yes. That's why. This smoke pit, this hell place out here, has created a lot of dissension, a lot of harsh words, a lot of bitterness, Amen. a lot of anguish. Yes. Huh? A lot of temper tantrums out here from all the baby smokers. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother rest everybody out there in the pit. That's why they won't say anything. But let me tell you something. He's there to be able to help us nourish the graces of Christian character. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says this, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, and beside all of this, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, 
and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, and why would they be in you? Because the Holy Spirit is in you. That's why. And abound they make you that you shall neither be bare nor unfruitful. The knowledge, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit wants to come and be able to implant and nourish the, the, the graces of Christian character. What kind of character you are. Now, all of us know about Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse, don't we? I mean, I think, I think they turned 70 or 80 years old. So I'm not sure how old they are. They're older than me. I know that much. But the thing about it is, all of us would know the characteristics of Mickey Mouse. It's easy for us to tell how he did and what he did and how he acted. And all. Popeye would be another one that you could be able to conjure up. All of you wanted Popeye's muscles and so mom and daddy make you eat spinach when you didn't Amen. like it. Huh? And so we see all these things abound for us. But you see, he wants me and you to have faith and to add to that faith a virtue he wants me to have virtue in my heart and in my life. And I'm not going to go into the characteristic of each one of these. But you see, he wants to add to our virtue. He wants to add knowledge. He wants you to know something. You know, there are times when I feel like I don't know very much. And I have to pray and say, oh, Lord, you give me wisdom. You did it for Solomon and you can do it for me. And the Lord sometimes opens things just right up, and I can see it, and I can do it. And then other things I have to struggle with, just like most everybody else does. But he wants me and you to learn to have knowledge. And he said, if we lack knowledge, what can we do? We can get a book and study it. We can get on Google and, and Google it. We can do oh, No, he didn't say that. He said, ask of God. Did that go over your head? I think it did. Let me, let me bring it down to the Lord. <laughs> I'll bring it down to the Lord. Break it down. If you want knowledge, you don't get a book or Google it. or anything. You ask God. Hallelujah. Was that low enough? No, was that, was that, maybe I should go lower. I'm not sure. Amen. I don't want any of this to go over your head. I want it to go to your heart. I want the Holy Spirit to help you. I want him to help me so that we can be able to understand if I am going to have the Holy Ghost living in my heart and in my life, I want to be a Christian gentleman and I want to have the graces that God intends for me to have. Every one of them, not just part of them. He said he would give to us knowledge, temperance, because self-control. Some of you can't even control your temper, let alone think about control anything else. Some of you can't control your mouth because you can't control any other part of your life. But the Holy Ghost can help us. He has a Christian grace that will help you to shut your mouth. He'll help you to keep your hands where they belong. Self-control. You see what I'm talking about? Temperance is what he's talking about. Add to that temperance, patience, and to patience, Godliness. Godliness is godlikeness. Does it make you God? Not by any means. But you're godlike. Why? Because you have God with you and you have God in you. The Holy Spirit, friends. And that makes all the difference in the world. And to the godliness, He wants to add brotherly kindness. I want to love you, not because I have to love you. Some of you said that, haven't you? I don't like them. I love them because I have to. That's not love. It's not love at all. Just be honest. Tell me you don't like me. Huh? To God and his brotherly kindness, he wants us to be kind with each other. The sharp words. The finger behind the back. Huh? The things... The things that are done to each other. All of those things, friends, Amen. we find, are not one of the graces of the Holy Spirit in your life and in your heart. Add to God and his brotherly kindness and their brotherly kindness, charity, love. 
That right there is the summation of all of it. Love. Let's love. It doesn't mean we go out and grab all the women and hug them up. It means we love each other. And there's a greater love, hear me for please, there's a greater love in our heart for us and God. There's a love between us and believers, and there has to be a love between us and those that aren't. There's a love between us and those that aren't. Christians have a sometimes say attitude about themselves that well because I am like I am and I am who I am then I am better than you are and so as a result we turn folks off sometimes because when they see that you think you're better than they are then they know they don't fit in your category they don't fit in your category and so therefore they feel like if you are what you say you are, and you do what you do, then I know I'm gonna make it okay. And that's their attitude. That's their attitude, friends. God wants us to love everybody. If we had as much love for each other as people had for their animals, we would be a great Christian nation. I'm serious, and I love my little old dog. Had him for 14 years. He thought he was king of the house. And when he died, I cried. You don't have something like that for 14, 15 years and not cry, not weep over him. He's gone. He's not there. Even the cat, when we came home, we had her. He was her daddy. And she loved him. And when we come home without him from up north, she wandered the house. She squalled and bawled every room. She went to his, his little basket that we had for him, and she'd get his toys out and lay them out in the living room floor, wondering where he's, where he's at. When's he going to come and get them? What, what's, what's happened to him? Yeah. Yeah. But I never loved that dog more than I did my wife. I never loved that dog more than I did my kids. I never loved that dog more than I do you all. Huh? Though some of you act worse than he did. <laughs> Friends, we have to have love. We, we want to reach out and encompass the whole world. I've often told the Lord, oh, help me just to embrace the whole world. And when I read missionary magazines, I, I just want to pack up my clothes and go there and help them out. Let me, let me preach the gospel to you just a little bit. When I go up north, I, I want to encompass all those people. And when they say, will you come and start a church? No, I won't. I'm where God wants me. I have to be right there because that's where God says, and I love it there. Why? Because I love you fellas. A few of you ladies, but I love you fellas. Fifthly, i got to hurry on. I don't preach as short as Brother Ledger. That's his heart. <laughs> Is the work of the Holy Spirit to assure us of our acceptance with God in our justified and our sanctified relationship with Him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 says, That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and to all, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When you come to a place of where you deeply repent, now hear me, friends, hear me. When you come to an altar, whether it's here or in your car, beside your bunk at work, out here in the backyard, the picnic table, up here at the guardhouse, it doesn't make any difference where you make your altar. But when you come to that place where you have come to your altar and you've truly repented over every sin, friends, let me tell you something. There is a transformation that takes yes. place and you're long, no longer the same old creature. Yes. Yes. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah forever. And all things are passed away. And all things become new. You come out of darkness into the marvelous light of God. But let me tell you something. You don't have to ask the preacher, am I saved? Huh? 
I've had folks to come to me and say, well, do you think I'm saved? And you know me. If you have to ask me, you're probably not. If you ask me, you're probably not. Well, that's an awful thing to say. I know it is, but it's truthful. I don't want any of you stand at judgment and point in my, my direction and say, you didn't tell me. Friends, there's a deep transformation. Your repentance will go as deep as your sin went. Your repentance will go as far as the sin in your life went, friends. And when you truly pray through, you will have such assurance that the work is done and that you now are part of the kingdom of God. And when you come to the place of where you seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost, where you get sanctified holy, let me tell you something, friends. When you die to self, and I mean die to self, and you put self on the altar, and you see self crucified, and you see self die out to every sin and to to yourself, friends, let me tell you something. There comes an assurance from heaven that now he's not just with you, but he's in you. Praise God forever. He will give you assurance of your justified state and your sanctified state and your relationship to him in it. Where are we, friends? Maybe you might tell me, well, I I believe that the Holy Spirit's with me. That's just part of it. He said he wouldn't be just with you, he'd be in you. See? See? And God wants to come. He wants to assure us. He wants to tell you, I love you. The Holy Spirit wants to embrace us. He wants to draw us up close. He wants to let us know, I love you. And I believe you've done what you've done. I'm here to help you. And the relationship then between me and God begins to develop. And we begin to grow. And we begin to see. Therefore, being justified by faith. This is the will of God, that you be sanctified holy. Those are some things that, friends, you'll see. And when you see them, when you recognize them, when you come to that place where the Holy Spirit has reached down, way down deep in your heart, and brought you to see that old carnal spirit that you have on the inside, that thing that rises up in anger at the drop of a pen, that thing that controls you and dominates you and makes you do what you don't want to do, as Paul said. then you know the Holy Spirit's not with you nor in you. You want, you want, you want Him and Him alone. Friends, don't seek an experience. A lot of churches are teaching, oh, seek this experience. You get this experience, you'll be hilarious. Oh, you'll swing from the rafters. You'll do this and you'll waller on the ground and, and on and on and on you'll go. No, 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 we don't seek an experience. You hear what I'm saying? We don't seek in it. We seek the blessed Holy Ghost. We're seeking Jesus Christ to save and to sanctify by the power of God's Spirit. Bringing us into His fellowship. Bringing us into a right relationship in our experience. And then not only doing that, but then assuring me. Assuring me that the work is done. Praise God forever. Assuring me. Giving me peace on the inside. Hallelujah forever. That it's taken care of. Praise God. On my end and his. Friends, we need to be in earnest about having the precious Holy Spirit taking charge of our lives and helping us to walk straight before Him. We need a real revival in our country. And we especially need revivals in our churches. Our churches have accepted and gone the wrong way and gone down the road of sin and then want to preach to people. Oh, friends, it bothers me. I never listen to the radio very much. It's, it's just not good, I can tell you that much. But now traveling is a little different story. But you see, in the brand new cars, they don't put CD players. 
So I'm at a disadvantage. They tell me I have to hook my phone up to my radio, and then I could play it. I tried that, but run my phone down. So there I was. I didn't have any music then either. You know, so, so what do you do? So I turned the radio on once in a while to kind of keep me awake, kind of give me a little bit, and hear some really good preaching. Praise God. Oh, tear up Jack. Name some sins. Lay the people out. And then get to the end of the message and tell them, oh, I'm sorry, you can't live like that. You have to sin. All of us sin. Well, why did he even preach it? Right. Just let the people go on like they were. Wow. But you see, friends, Jesus presented the truth about himself to the disciples who were believers and needed the presence of the Holy Spirit in sanctifying grace in their hearts and lives. He showed them Divine truths. When you read that whole, those whole three or four chapters there dealing in the Last Supper discourse, he showed them some divine truths about the Holy Ghost. And it would take us well to heed what Jesus spoke. So I ask you the question tonight. Does he have an office in your life? Where are you? Tonight. I want you to stand with me, please. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a minute, if you will, please. Friends, this is serious business. It's a real serious business. The salvation of your soul is concerning me, concerning Brother Ledger concerning Brother Jerome, concerning our other managers. And you should be in earnest about your own soul as much as we are about it. You should be as much as interested in where you're going for eternity as, than we are to try to show you where you're going. Some of us Spend hours in prayer. Some of us pray at nighttime for you. Some of us early morning. And yet, and yet you have turned into ducks. All of you, uh, just like Donald Duck. When the truth comes, it rolls right off you, just like water off Donald Duck's back. You get the picture? That's where some of you are tonight, friends. That's where some of you are tonight. What will you do with your life? What are you going to do with your life? Continue down the same journey? The altar's open. I know I preached a lengthy message, message for a Wednesday night service. That's okay. I had to deliver my heart to you. And some of you here... Some of you will face this message in eternity. Some of you. <coughs> Father, we bow before you tonight. We've delivered what we felt like you wanted us to preach. And Lord, we pray tonight the blessed Holy Spirit is so real. He's anxious to help us. He wakens us and excites us and gives us that which we need to be able to walk carefully before you with the graces. He teaches us about sensibilities and how to be sensitive to the perception of the Holy Spirit in our life and our heart. He teaches us truth. Lord, I pray tonight, please don't let the men go out not, not expecting something, but Lord, we pray that they'll come and they'll seek your face and find a real life-changing experience of grace in their life and their heart, I pray. Thank you again tonight. Trouble those, dear Lord. Trouble them, I ask, with conviction. Don't let them be able to eat. Don't let them sleep. Don't let them work. Don't let them have any pleasure, Lord, but what they don't constantly think about the state of their soul where it is before you. In Jesus' name, amen.